In this video, we're going to talk about three of the accessory organs to the digestive system. We've talked fairly extensively about the digestive tract from the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine. But like I said, this is going to be about three accessory organs, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, but merely, mainly on the liver. What we see in this image right here is a portion of a hepatic lobule that carries out a lot of the work of the liver. And so we will detail, we'll get into good detail on this. Quick review, esophagus gives rise to the stomach, then the small intestine. Specific to us for this lecture is the duodenum, which we see in green. In the upper right-hand quadrant of the abdomen and the upper right-hand region of this image. And when I say right-hand, we're assuming this individual is facing us. We find the liver in blue. Immediately under the liver, we find the gallbladder. And then right in the middle of this image right here, we have the pancreas. So pancreas, gallbladder, liver, and this is a duodenum. So let's take a, a look at the pancreas and gallbladder briefly before we get into the details of the liver. So the gallbladder is a pretty simple organ. It stores bile. So bile is used to emulsify, emulsify fats during digestion in the duodenum and the jejunum. And that means it's breaking fats down into smaller particles to increase the surface area. So the lipases, the digestive enzymes that break down lipids and fats, can gain access to more surface area or gain access to more of the substance of the fat. So once again, bile, bile emulsifies fats. Bile is produced in the liver. So in this image right here in tannish is the liver. This is the gallbladder. This is the pancreas. And this is a duodenum. The gallbladder merely stores bile. Now bile is continually secreted by the liver and it will move down this bile duct right here, essentially into the duodenum. And we're going to elaborate on that pathway a little bit. If bile is produced in excess, it starts backing up and moves into the gallbladder until it is needed again. So once again, bile is produced in the liver and it moves to the gallbladder via the right and left hepatic ducts, which merge into a common hepatic duct. This is a cystic duct, which is a two-way duct. That is to say, bile will move into the gallbladder to be stored there and will actually be released from the gallbladder via the cystic duct. And then it turns into the common bile duct. So just to be clear, and this is oftentimes just referred to as the bile duct. This is a common hepatic duct. This is a common bile duct or merely known as the bile duct. The bile duct is going to meet up with the pancreatic duct that we see right here, running down the center of the pancreas. The two of those are going to join into a chamber that we see in, I don't know what color this is, greenish, which is the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And within that, there is a sphincter known as the sphincter of Adi that regulates the release of bile and the pancreatic juices. So someone who doesn't have a gallbladder is still okay because their liver is still continually producing bile and the control of the re release of the bile into the duodenum is achieved by the sphincter of Odi, which is within the hepatopancreatic ampulla that we see in this region right here. So to be clear, the bile duct meets up with the pancreatic duct. The pancreas is an organ that is has both endocrine functions and exocrine. And when we say endocrine, we're referring to hormones. These are signaling molecules released into the bloodstream. The two main hormones from the pancreas are insulin and glucagon. Glucagon increases blood glucose levels in times of need. Insulin decreases blood glucose levels. There are over 22 digestive enzymes released from the pancreas specifically from granules known as zymogen granules. And those make up the exocrine function of the pancreas, the release of enzymes via pancreatic juices into the pancreatic duct and then joining with the bile duct into the hepatopancreatic ampulla. 
Okay, we're going to talk about the liver, and this is going to be fairly extensive and somewhat complicated. I do acknowledge that. So bear with me right here. So the first thing I want to talk about is circulation of blood to, through, and leaving the liver. So we have talked about in previous videos of general circulation that coming off the celiac trunk, coming off the aorta is a celiac trunk, which splits into three. One of those trifurcations is the common hepatic duct, which gives rise to the hepatic artery proper, which will divide into the right and left hepatic arteries going into the liver. So that is one source of blood going to the liver. And by and large, this blood that I just described coming from the aorta through the common hepatic artery, hepatic artery proper, and right and left hepatic arteries, which are not seen in this image, are utilized to perfuse the liver with oxygen and nutrient-rich blood, just like arterial blood is doing throughout the whole body. But we also have venous blood dropping into the liver. Right here, we see the hepatic portal vein, and that's bringing blood to the liver as well. And this is where it gets somewhat confusing because generally we see in organs throughout the body, we see an artery bringing blood to the organ and veins bringing blood away from organs. For example, the renal artery brings blood to the kidneys. The renal vein takes blood away from the kidneys. The coronary artery takes blood to the myocardium. Cardiac veins take blood away from the myocardium. The common carotid artery is taking blood up to the brain and the internal jugular vein is draining the brain of blood. So here we have both an artery, which we don't see here, which is the hepatic artery proper and the right and left hepatic arteries, plus this hepatic portal vein providing blood to the liver. The hepatic portal vein is bringing blood to the liver that has newly absorbed substances in its plasma, specifically nutrients, vitamins, minerals, water, anything that has been absorbed from the digestive tract, from the small intestine. Certainly this could include alcohol, it could include any pharmaceuticals, it could include any sort of drugs that have been consumed. The goal is to bring all of this absorbed material into the liver to get purified and assessed and surveyed before it's put into the general circulation. And right here, I have the inferior vena cava. That is the general circulation. That is to say, this is where those newly absorbed components of the blood plasma are en route back to the heart to move into the arterial circulation to provide the body with all of these nutrients, minerals, vitamins, what have you. So once again, the hepatic portal vein is draining blood into the liver. Here and here are the hepatic veins draining blood into the inferior vena cava. To be clear, we have intestinal veins draining into the hepatic portal vein, gastric veins, splenic vein, pancreatic veins, all draining into the hepatic portal vein which is then going to proceed to regions within the liver known as the hepatic lobules. And that's what we see right here. In the middle of each lobule, we see a central vein. And then the central veins are ultimately going to drain blood into the right and left hepatic veins and then join into the main hepatic vein, moving into the inferior vena cava. I realize that's a lot of information. We're going to try to break it down into more simple, simpler detail. So let's take a look at these images, the first of which is going to be focusing on the hepatic lobules. This is showing three hepatic lobules. In the middle of each hepatic lobule is a central vein. So that central vein is going to move purified blood, blood that has been surveilled for any sort of pathogens, toxins, what have you, the blood in the central vein is going to drain into the right and left hepatic veins, which will drain into the main hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava to move into the general circulation. Additionally, we see bile ductules that we'll elaborate on in addition to a vein and an artery right here. This is really an offshoot. This artery is an offshoot of the hepatic arteries 
and this blue vein and any of these blue veins are offshoots of the hepatic portal vein, bringing blood to the hepatic lobules. So to be clear, this vessel here and this vessel here, the vein and the artery, are bringing blood into the lobule. And this right here, the bile, is taking bile away from the liver. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And we see a pizza right here. I think this is a pepperoni mushroom olive pizza. This is not my image. But if we were to put the central vein in here, it'd be right in the middle of this pizza. And the reason I'm using this is because we are going to look at a slice of the hepatic lobule. So think of it as a slice of the pizza where we're just taking out one of these slices and we're going to see the central vein associated with it and the other components of the lobule. But we're only going to be looking at a slice or segment of the lobule. Okay, so here's the slice I was referring to. Right here is the central vein. This is a branch off of the hepatic portal vein, bringing blood to this portion of the lobule. This is, once again, a branch off the hepatic artery. And this is a unique situation where arterial blood and venous blood are bringing blood to the same region and mixing with each other. This pink area that the arterial blood and the venous blood is draining into is known as a hepatic sinusoid. And it's a type of blood vessel lacking nothing but the endothelium or the simple squamous epithelial cells, which we see in blue right here. And these simple squamous epithelial cells are fenestrated, which we don't see in this image. But these simple squamous endothelial cells are lining the hepatic sinusoids. We see a cup for cell right here, which is a phagocytic cell or a macrophage of the liver. So once again, the cup for cell is in a hepatic macrophage. And the majority of these lobules are composed of simple cuboidal epithelial cells. Occasionally, there's two layers, as we see here, or just one layer. And if we zoom in right here, we can see these cuboidal cells have microvilli on them or a brush border because there's a lot of secretion and absorption occurring within the apical surface of these cells. So in short, what is going to happen is the simple cuboidal epithelial cells of the lobules are both absorbing and secreting substances. They may be absorbing and secreting the exact same substances. So they may be absorbing amino acids and, amino acids and glucose, for example, that have been recently absorbed via the digestive tract. Those are move into these simple cuboidal epithelial cells. And then once they are purified and all the contents are purified, they can move back into the hepatic sinusoids and then move into the central vein. And theoretically, all of the blood, nutrients, vitamins, minerals are pathogen free and okay to move into the general circulation. This right here is the bile ductual and bile is being produced within the simple cuboidal cells released into the bile canaliculi, which then move into this ductual. And then that's going to move into the right and left hepatic ducts, into the common hepatic duct, and then either in up the cystic duct to be stored in the gallbladder or down the common bile duct to be released into the duodenum. Okay, I believe I mentioned previously that the only digestive function of the liver, and if I had, didn't mention it, I'm going to mention it now, the only digestive function of the liver is the production of bile, which helps break down fats within the small intestine. But the liver has upwards of 500 different functions. I certainly can't name all those functions some of which are lipid metabolism, that is the breakdown of lipids and the synthesis of lipids. So keep in mind, our body is continually breaking things down and building things back up. The, these are metabolic processes known as anabolism and catabolism. The liver makes amino acids. So occasionally you may hear the term essential amino acids. Those are amino acids our body cannot make and we have to consume within our diet. But those other amino acids our body can make 
and that is achieved within the liver. Our body creates urea, which is due to the, due to the breakdown or catabolism of proteins, purifies blood as we've talked about. It stores glucose in the form of glycogen. It synthesizes almost all of the plasma proteins we've spoken about and stores vitamins and minerals. So the liver has a whole host of functions, only one of which the production of bile is directly related to digestion.